Good morning. Good to see you this beautiful Sunday morning. Let's turn to 295. 295, revive us again. Let's stand together. Trust that's the prayer of your heart today. Revive us again. 295. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who was born all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen. What is revival? Revival is the dead things in our life being rekindled, as it says in the song here, the things that are lacking being renewed. It is God's people being right with him. And many good spiritual things come forth out of that. Revival is not indicated by great rejoicing and a great many amens. It is shown by God's people usually weeping and repenting. And out of that does come rejoicing and many good things. But we have to understand what revival is and what it is not. So we pray God revive us again. God, get me closer to you and your word. That's what we're saying. We trust that's your prayer this morning. Father, we pray that you'd help us today. We thank you that we're able to be here and we pray that you would revive us again. Whatever is in our hearts, may we say, help us to be closer to you. Let nothing be off limits. And may we truly want that revival. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for the blessings of the week. Thank you for the Sunday school hour that we were able to have together. We pray you'd help us now. Fill us with your spirit. We'll give you the glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Turn to 406, if you would please. 406, same hymn book. My hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price all my sin at Calvary. All four verses, 406. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. For me he died, for me he lives, and everlasting life and light he freely gives. No merit of my own is anger to suppress. My only hope is found in Jesus' righteousness. For me he died, for me he lives, and everlasting life and light he freely gives. And now for me he stands before the Father's throne. 
shows his wounded hands and names me as his own. For me he died, for me he lives, and everlasting life and light he freely gives. His grace has planned it all, tis mine but to believe, and his work of love and Christ receive. For me he died, for me he lives, and everlasting life and light he freely gives. Amen. By way of announcements, plan on having church as normal, Sun, uh, Wednesday, 7 o'clock, so please be in your place. We'll continue our study on giving thanks always, as we have. And so service, 7 o'clock Wednesday, we will sing and pray and teach the Word. We trust. We have books on the table in the back, just to remind you about them. And also, we have a birthday card for Matthew, so he's turning a year older here very soon. We'll get a card down to him at Pensacola, and so please do sign the card back there on the table and let him know you're thinking about him, praying for him, and wishing him a happy birthday. He'll be done here before too long, so it's by, yep, about a month, so he'll be heading for finals and be done his first year of college. So that's hard to believe, but we praise the Lord for that. We're almost done school for the year, too. Jimmy's got his last week of math this week. And I say that because I'm cheering on the inside and will cheer on the outside, probably. And not that it's been hard. It's just 34 weeks of math or whatever. So <laughs> of algebra, where is it? Algebra 1, that's not even as hard as Algebra 2. So we'll just... See what we have for next year. But it's always a joy when school finish up, finishes up for the year, and we're thankful for that, and I know the kids are excited for that too. Well, Phoebe is going to play for you out of hymn number 202. If you turn there in your hymn book and follow along, she's got a few or three verses to play of 202, which is Amazing Grace. Okay, thank you, Phoebe. That song written by John Newton way back when. The 1800s is when the melody came out. I'm not sure when the words were written, but John Newton, we talked this morning and also Wednesday about folks that know the gospel. They know what the Word of God says about being saved. If you know John Newton's biography, he was one of those guys. He knew the gospel. 
We also talked about the fact that it takes drastic circumstances so often to get people's attention, to break up that hardened heart. And the testimony, I'm not going to give you the full testimony, but just off the top of my head, John Newton knew the gospel. His mother had given him the gospel and prayed for much of his life that he would be saved. And the man rejected it, hardened his own heart, and just became this uh, terrible individual, basically. Worked on a slave ship back in the days when they would s grab slaves from Africa, right? And worked on a slave ship, was known for his foul mouth, uh, especially being able to curse so much that... <laughs> Uh, to his own shame, no doubt, he put his uh, captain to shame for how much he could curse, it is said, without repeating a word. He fell into depravity so much that he became a slave himself to a, a some queen of slaves or whatnot out of Africa. And it was not until God just took him through it, as we say. He, he was in the midst of a hurricane or some terrible storm, and he cried out to the Lord and accepted Christ and became a preacher became a pastor, and out of all that came this song, Amazing Grace. And you think of how terrible he was and the 180 that God took on his life or did on his life, and yes, indeed, Amazing Grace. And you think about the most terrible of individuals, and all of us are wicked-hearted, aren't we? And, um, but people say, this is what I used to be in, this is what I used to do, and we shouldn't glorify the devil in any of that, but just it's amazing what God does in hearts and lives. And I, I encourage you, look it up on the internet or find a biography. If you want me to find it for you, I can, but all you have to do is just Google John Newton's history and tremendous Tremendous thing that God did in his life. Some of the best hymns, you can't weigh one hymn above another, but some many of the familiar hymns, I should say, the things that we are very familiar with, you know, It Is Well and Amazing Grace came out of very hard times for people, and they realized God's goodness in those times. Let's look at Ephesians 5, if you would. We'll read our verse. Then we'll get into part 34 of giving thanks always. And we're going to look at, I was telling Dad last night, another person I've never preached on. And this is, again, I'm thankful for expository preaching because this is what it makes us do is to handle the difficult passages, handle the things that maybe you've never heard before, I've never taught or preached. And that's good because we need the whole counsel of God. Uh, maybe we'll run into some things that are a bit uncomfortable, and there's some uncomfortable things in here today, things that we don't like to think about, but they're things that do happen to people, and we have to, have to acknowledge that they're real instead of living in a fantasy world, if you will. So look at Ephesians 5 to begin with, and verse 20 says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God, and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would help us to be a thankful people and to thank you for your goodness, especially as we heard Phoebe play as amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found to was blind, but now I see it. it wasn't just John Newton, that was all of us. All of us. Wretches lost in sin, all of us need to see your grace in our lives and be thankful for what you've done. 
And Father, I pray you'd help us to do so. If there be anyone here today that's not saved, I pray they would see that they're a wretch lost in sin, and that they're bound for hell, and without Christ, they will go there. And help that person to turn to Christ, or those people, or whoever it is, to turn to Christ today, and to see your grace for what it is, to see you for who you are, and to be glad and thankful. Father, we just pray that you'd help us. Whatever else you have to say to us today, through your word we pray that you would challenge us, convict us, show us your truth, make us glad that we are your children. We'll thank you. Again, we pray that you'd fill us with your spirit, help us to die to ourselves, and we'll give you the glory. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Giving thanks always, as we've been covering, are you thankful that you're God's child? We just talked about John Newton, and boy, no doubt he was thankful he was God's child. Are you thankful that God chose to save you, that God gave you understanding? We talked about that in Sunday school, that God blinds hearts and he gives understanding. That's why we need to pray that God will give those that are blinded understanding. We ought to have a burden for souls, a burden for our family members that are unsaved, a burden for our friends and neighbors. We ought to. It's a good thing to have. You say, well, it doesn't make me feel very good. Didn't make Paul feel very good or Jesus feel very good either. <laughs> but it's why we're here. We ought to care and care enough to pray. And God, it may be so, will give understanding will open blinded eyes, and he gets the glory for all that. Are you thankful, if you're here today and you are God's child, are you thankful for that? Are you thankful for that? Now, out of that gratitude, are you thankful for his word? Are you thankful for his word? Because it alone is God's word, right? Are you reading it? Are you studying to apply it? That's one of the fun things, and Sarah and I were talking this morning just about Sunday school and how we get to sit and share what God has spoken to us about in our Bible reading and how that's a, a joyous thing. It's not a burdensome thing at all. It's a joyous thing to be able to share that and to be able to hear what others say and share with each other because I don't know about you, but the two of us did not grow up doing that. We grew up our whole lives with everything basically becoming a church service, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and all of that. And it, it's just been refreshing to sit and share what God speaks to us about throughout the week. It's accountability, yes, and it's also... Um, encouraging, yes, and it's not burdensome at all. And so we're thankful for that. And my wife said, well, what if, what if the classes get too big? What if that should happen? I said, I mean, just split them up and, you know, someone else has a class and they can lead that and share what God has shown them in the scripture and it can just continue and that's, that's good. That's good. There's nothing like that. We need it, I believe. Are you thankful for God's word? You know, being able to do that in Sunday school is just one way that we're able to show we're thankful for God's word. And you can do that throughout the week, through your family, with friends, and what have you. Are you thankful for God's word? And are you thankful for his spirit? It's God's Spirit that helps us to understand the Word, to apply it to our lives. And that's where we are, looking at strife as we consider the fruit of the flesh and then eventually the fruit of the Spirit. So Galatians 5, 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Ye are not under the law. 
Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery and fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, and strife. We covered all the previous and defined what they mean. If you're wondering about the definitions, feel free to come and ask and we'll give those to you. But we're looking at strife. Strife. We considered for the past several services the example of Korah, that conspiracy that that man made against Moses and Aaron, and just the craziness of it all, right? Well, we're going to look at some more crazy as is our understanding, according to Scripture, here in the next few services, at least with a man named Absalom. You've probably heard of Absalom, the son of David. We're going to consider that. Well, what is strife? It is electioneering. It's been defined. It is seeking to advance yourself, to put yourself ahead. It is not so much out of wrath and hatred as much pride. Just wanting to get ahead, doing whatever it takes to get ahead. You'll step on anybody to do that. That's what the world does, and it happens all through, all through the world, all through our country, in homes and governments and workplaces and what have you, as we've discussed. But look at 2 Samuel 13, if you would please, and we're going to be there for this time and a couple services at least. I don't know how long it'll take to go through Absalom, but at least the next couple. 2 Samuel 15, or 13, excuse me, will be in 15 eventually. Absalom, you have a bitter person causing division instead of working things out. Corey, he, he kind of made himself bitter. You get the idea for personal glory, made himself bitter against Moses and Aaron seeing things that weren't there, you know, Dathan and Abiram, we, we considered those individuals casting out things that couldn't be proven and weren't true. And again, we challenge one another today. We have to watch our hearts. We have to watch our hearts. Or else very bad things can come in our families, in the church, in our workplace. It's like Jimmy said today, I have to watch that I don't assume that people think a certain way about me or say th certain things or do certain things. We have to know what's going on. If we perceive something to be a certain way, we need to get more information instead of assuming. Because we can be very wrong and very bad things can come out of that in any level of our lives. So we see Absalom, the man who fell into bitterness against his own father, which drove him to seek elevation. And we're going to consider that, especially, I believe, in 2 Samuel 15. And you say, what caused all this to happen? The core reason that all this happened with Absalom is because David made a bad decision in chapters 11 and 12 of 2 Samuel, which is his incident with Bathsheba. And if you read through that, you know that David saw Bathsheba bathing herself on the rooftop. And instead of turning away, he lusted after her and he committed adultery with her and she became pregnant through him. And instead of repenting at that time, he chose to embark upon this mass cover-up and when Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, would not cooperate, but showed himself to be a just man, David tried to manipulate him and then tried to get him drunk and did get him drunk and tried to manipulate him. And even while drunk, he would not be manipulated. And so David could have repented at that time, but he didn't. You see how the craziness of sin just go down down, down. And so he commands his commander 
to put Uriah on the front lines. Uriah was one of his mighty men, one of his special forces, one of the men that loved David. And David probably knew Uriah fairly well. But David chose sin over right. David, the man that was after God's own heart, right? God says this of him, the man after God's own heart. Yeah, he did all this wickedness. He backslid and slid far. He put your eye on the front lines, and the front lines was where the fighting is the hardest and where people died, and David knew this, and he effectively murdered Uriah. David was fine with the cover-up. He was happy with himself till God sent the prophet Nathan to come in and to confront him with it. And then David repented. Then David repented, and you have, I believe it's Psalm, what is it, 53, dear? 51. I get numbers mixed up. This is Psalm 51 it shows David's repentance, his sorrow of heart, and he ended up losing a baby because of that. He also ended up losing many of his children. That was part of the judgment of God. And the first incident that would prove this was Absalom. Well, the first incident was Amnon, which we're going to look at. And out of that came Absalom, and out of that came other terrible things. So you say, why is all this happening? It's because of David's sin. Because of David's sin. God's judgment upon his family. But look here in 2 Samuel 13. We're going to look first at the context of why Absalom decided to cause division in the nation of Israel against his father, David. The context. So first, who was Absalom? Who was Absalom? You find that in 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse number 1 through 3. You'll find that Absalom was one of David's sons, of course. He was the third born son of David. It says, Now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And unto David were sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn, now, Keep this in mind because we're going to talk about the man. His firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess. And his second, by the way, who you almost never hear a thing about, Kiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Jeshur. And so Absalom's the third born son of David to Micah. He had previously taken two wives, according to 2 Samuel 25, verse 39 through 44. He had previously taken two wives, Abigail and Ahinoam, which we just read about. And at this point, he'd apparently taken several more wives to himself during his time in Hebron. And if you know anything about David's history, you know that after Saul died, David went to Judah and reigned for several years before being able to go to Jerusalem and reign over Israel proper, because at that point, the kingdom was split between David and the children of Saul. And so that's what's talking about this war here, David waxing stronger and stronger, house of Saul weaker and weaker. And eventually, David did sit on the throne in Jerusalem, but not immediately. So during this time, he took several wives to himself, and sadly, it was through these children he would have the most trouble. The most trouble. We understand as far as David's uh, marital history goes, he had his first wife, Michael, which was the daughter of Saul, given to him by Saul. 
But eventually through his exile and whatnot, 1 Samuel 25, 44 tells us that she was given to another man. So at that point, David's marriage to her was basically null and void. But then you find in 1 Samuel 25 again, he married Abigail, and if you know that story, with Nabal. Nabal was a wicked man and God smote him and killed him. And then David married Abigail. But he was not satisfied to stop there. You do find in 2 Samuel 3 that he did have a child, which was Kiliab, through Abigail. But his third wife, this Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, was the one that Amnon was born to, right? The firstborn. If not for that, Kiliab would have been the firstborn. If David, the, the point is this, and we see this repeated in scripture, it seems, if David would have just been satisfied with one wife, <laughs> one wife, then the incidents with Amnon and Absalom and later Adonijah would never have happened. But he wasn't satisfied with one wife. Now, God never bans polygamy in the law, but he never promotes it either. God's plan, God's way, and we see that all the way back in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, is one man for one woman for life. One man for one woman. Now think about this. Think about where all the trouble has come from in the history of Scripture. You think about Jacob taking several wives. Abraham taking several wives. It was Abraham and Sarah. It would be through Sarah that Isaac would be born. But what did they do? Abraham married Hagar. And through that, the Arab nation exists today. Trouble to the Jews, right? Think about Jacob. Jacob marries Leah. People say, well, he was tricked. Well, he still married Leah. And then Rachel, and then their handmaids, and through them you have the 12 tribes of Israel. But through the children of Rachel and the two handmaids were where the trouble came. <laughs> it wasn't through the children of Leah. You ever realize that? The children of Leah, by the way, those four children, one is Judah, Another one is Levi. <laughs> and what do we have here? You have David. Now, to Saul's credit, as far as we know, he only married one woman. But David amassing all these wives to himself, and trouble would come from them. And Solomon amassing all these wives to even far more than David. It was something like a thousand wives and concubines. And what they do to him, they turned his heart to idolatry. Interesting lesson in scripture, isn't it? One man, one woman for life. So if you get nothing else today, there's that. But who is Absalom? He's the third born child, the third born child of David. Now what happened to Absalom in First Sam Second Samuel 13? What happened to him to, people would say, make him. Now, it wasn't that he was made to do this. It was he chose to do this, okay? Yes, terrible things happened to Absalom and to his sister, Tamar. Terrible things happened. But it was still his choice to do what he did. We always have a choice. We always have a choice. No amount of excuse justifies our sin. And we have to get that in our heads. My wife and I have had to learn and are still learning that. No amount of sin is justified by our excuses. We can excuse and excuse and excuse. There's people, they drop out at you. Oh, those people were mean to me. That pastor was mean to me. On and on and on. I'm never going to church again. Well, that's a bad choice. There's people that refuse to be saved. They say, well, well those people... 
They, don't, they call themselves Christians. They don't act like God says. And those people, and the, here's, a, here's a clue, folks. Here's the truth. Most people that call themselves Christians are not, not according to God's word. They're not. Jesus, uh, it's why he tells us to judge with righteous judgment, to look at people's lives and the fruit or lack thereof that comes out of it. So we can know, we can know as much as we under, can understand who is saved, who is true, who is not. That's why he gives us his word to judge, if you will, to con uh, pair between what people do and what they don't do. To know what is true Bible Christianity and what is not. Not because someone slaps a title on their sign or on their statement of faith. We have to judge between what God's word says. Most of what is out there that calls itself Christian is not. Is not. And for people to say and to use as an excuse, well, I'm not going to be saved because they say they're Christians and they don't act like Christ. That's just a cop-out people use to try to excuse themselves from being saved. We have no excuse for our bad choices. Well, they hurt my feelings. My feelings have been hurt. Well, we have to get over it. And God helps us to get over it. He gives us that grace. We don't stop going to the doctor just because we went to one bad one. We don't stop going to Walmart just because we went to one bad one or had one bad cashier. People just make excuses to try to condone their sin. Absalom and Tamar went through a very bad situation. It doesn't make what he did right. Let's get that straight. Make it clear. So what happened to him? It's really not so much as what happened to him, but what happened to his sister. He was apparently a man that loved his sister very much. So what happened, we see here in 2 Samuel 13. We'll read down through it, then we'll come back and we'll grab several lessons that we can learn from it. But it says, It came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. So Tamar was apparently, as far as we can tell, not a half-sister, but a full, uh, Tamar was full, the full sister, there I got it out, to Absalom. And so it says, and Amnon, the son of David, this is David's firstborn, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister, Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. So this firstborn, Amnon, falls in, let's put some quotes up here, falls in love with his half-sister, Tamar. Now, we have to understand this is against the Mosaic law. This is forbidden, forbidden, okay? The law allowed for cousins to get married, first cousins to get married, according to the Mosaic law. Not talking American law, talking Mosaic law. But did not allow for half-siblings to get married. It says, but Amnon had a friend in verse number three, whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. So Jonadab was not just his friend, but also his cousin. But it says, Jonadab was a very subtle man. That word subtle means crafty. Crafty. And he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? He says, What's wrong, Amnon? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, I may see it, and eat it at her hand. So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. 
And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said to the king, I pray thee, let Tamar my sister come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat at her hand. Now, is this good advice and is he doing a good thing? No. No. There's a lesson there which we will cover. A David sent home to Tamar saying, go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. And so Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house and was laid down. So apparently, you know, these are grown children. They have their own houses as the king's children, of course. And he was laid down. She took flour and kneaded it, made cakes in his sight, and did bake the cakes. And she took a pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, have out all men from me. So apparently there were, you know, people... Amnon's friends, his weight staff, what have you, that were around him as is around anyone that is royalty or in leadership like that, just like politics in our day. And he's casting everyone out. It says, they went out every man from him. Again, is that a good idea? No. And Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat of thy hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. She's trying to do what's right. He's trying to do what's wrong. And I, she says, whither shall I cause my shame to go? As for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he'll not withhold me from thee. She's trying to probably buy time because the law says that to marry half-siblings is illegal. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she forced her and lay with her. And then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise and be gone. So what's the first thing that happened is that uh, Tamar had this happen to her. And Absalom had to understand that this happened. I mean, just imagine. And she said, when Amnon says, Arise and be gone. He tries to cast her out. She says, There is no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. So he didn't really love her. It was just lust. And he called his servant that ministered unto him and said, Put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. And she had a garment of diverse colors upon her, for with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparelled. And then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. You see, it was a, it is not so much in our day, but it was a, an important thing, a joyous thing to be pure in David's day. In our day, not so much. People act like animals, don't they? Just do whatever you want. Sleep with whoever you want. doesn't matter. No, it does. It does matter to God. Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of diverse colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. She's in grief because of this happening to her. And just so, as this happens to uh, people in our day, to ladies, and it, it affects them, certainly. She's in grief. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. So he's taking care of his sister, and rightly so. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth, and rightly so. And Absalom spoke unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon. Now here's the seed that's planted, a bitterness. He hated Amnon because he forced his sister Tamar. It came to pass 
after two full years, Absalom had sheep shears, and it goes on from there. It goes on to there, from there. So what happened, it wasn't as much what happened to Absalom, it was what happened to Tamar. And then what David did not do, as we're going to see, he was wroth, but he didn't do anything about it. As far as the Bible tells us, at least, and especially Absalom had to wait two years. Two years. And then he meted out his own justice. Sad. This is a tragedy. This is something we don't like to read, something we don't like to admit happens in our own world. But it does, doesn't it? And yet, it does not excuse Absalom's choice. It doesn't excuse it. It doesn't mean it's not terrible. It is terrible. But it doesn't make what he did okay. And what he did was conspire against his father, kill his oldest brother, and end up being killed himself. What he did was foster bitter hatred in his heart toward his brother, toward his father, for years. And we're not going to see that it's just two years, but it's years and years that he held this grudge. It took years and years for this conspiracy to take hold, this division to be caused in the country. Many years, and he would not let it go. Challenge to us about our own hearts, isn't it? Very bad things can happen if we don't let things go. And I know I've had some bad things happen to me too. If I told you about it, if you don't already know about it, you'd say, how can people do that? People are wicked. And so are we. Our hearts are desperately wicked. We have a flesh. The only way that we're different is by God's grace because of what Christ has done for us. The world is wicked, folks. And it does wicked things. Amnon, he was likely not a saved man. Absalom, likely not a saved man. As far as we can tell. Didn't follow after their father David much, did they? So let's look at six quick lessons we can learn just from this passage before we move on to the choice that Absalom made. One, be careful who you fall in love with. Again, quotes. Fall in love with. We know that Amnon did not love Tamar. He lusted after her. He lusted after her so much that he became sick. Not, not to mention that he faked being sick, but he became sick. He fell sick, verse 2 says, for his sister Tamar. He was so love-struck, or full of lust, if you will, that Jonadab even noticed the difference in the man's demeanor and said, what is going on with you? Be careful who you fall in love with. Because we have to understand, and our world talks about love and knows nothing of it. When it talks about love, it's talking about lust. When God is talking about love, he's talking about a fruit of the Spirit. When the world talks about love, it's talking about, by and large, a work of the flesh called lust. Oh, I love him. Don't, don't we tell our kids, we warn them when they're growing up, if some boy or some girl says uh, to them, well, if you really love me, you'll sleep with me, right? That's just lust. That's just lust. I mean, how, every adult in here has heard that. And every parent should be telling their kids about those people that do that, right? that come up and say, well, if you really love me, you'll do this. 
And if you weren't warned before, you're warned now. That's just lust. Lust is a carnal work of the flesh. Lust is falling to thinking about someone. That Jesus warns about it in Matthew chapter 5. It's where you cannot or will not stop thinking about someone. If you're talking about covetousness, you could talk about something also. And the fact is, folks, we need to have control of our emotions because lust is an emotion. We have to have control of that or it will control us. When we talk about that, it's not just lust, by the way. It's anger, wrath, sadness, despair. We have to control it or it will control us. Didn't it control Amnon here? You say, how can I control my emotions? I'm a very emotional person. God will help you. That's why we have to be in the word every day and seek to apply it and pray, God, help me to do what I need to do to please you, even when I don't feel like doing it. You see, if we don't feel like doing what's right, we give in to our emotions, and that's our emotions controlling us, isn't it? It's our emotions controlling us. But we're talking about lusting after a person here. Jesus says, verse 27, Matthew 5, you have heard it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, meaning that you see that person and you can't stop thinking about them. You will not stop thinking about them. It's not glancing and looking away. It is you will not let them go from your mind. That is what lust is. It's a matter of the heart. It says that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And he warns us to do whatever we can to avoid that. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And he goes on from there. Be careful who you fall in love with. Quote, unquote. Because lust is a work of the flesh. And we are told in Exodus 20 and verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Are we not? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And again in Job 31 and verse 1. Job 31 and verse 1. Job makes this wise statement here in the midst of all this. He says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? He says, why should I lust after a woman? He says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I think upon a maid? Lust is a work of the flesh. Folks, we control what we do and do not love. You know, godly love is choosing love. People say, well, I just don't love them anymore. Well, they have chosen that for themselves. People talk about falling out of love. They've chosen to stop loving if they ever love them at all. It could be just like what happened with Amnon and Tamar, where Amnon did the deed, and then after the deed was done, it was fulfilled, he hated her. He hated her. We control who we do and do not love. And as far as marriage partners, especially, we must love godly individuals. If we're not careful, lust will take control of us. And it's mentioned much in scriptures, ruin many lives, especially in the Proverbs where Solomon says, don't give in, don't go in, don't take to yourself strange women, people that do not belong to you. And Tamar did not belong to Amnon. They were not married according to the law. They could not be married. He was given over to his lust. Be careful. Be careful. We can get obsessed. And we can get obsessed with people. We can get obsessed with things. 
We need to be careful. Number two, be careful of who your friends are. Be careful of who your friends are because we will, and we already talked about this in Sunday school, we will become who we are around. That's a resounding theme for the past few weeks for some reason. We'll become her, who we are around. And what was Jonadab? Jonadab was a liar, <laughs> wasn't he? He was a crafty man, a subtle man. Be careful who your friends are because the truth is this, and to our shame at times, we will often listen to our friends more than strangers, won't we? We'll listen to the people we're comfortable around. We'll listen to the people that we're closer to than random Joe that comes in off the street, whether he's speaking truth or not. We'll often listen to our friends more than strangers, so be careful who your friends are. We see that with Rehoboam in 1 Kings after Solomon dies, Rehoboam gathers to himself two groups of people. One, his friends, his buddies. And then the older men that were not his friends and buddies, though they spoke truth. Rehoboam was wondering how to treat the people of Israel. And Rehoboam's wicked friends told him, treat them poorly basically, to summarize. You can read it for yourself. And the wise older men said, treat them well, and they will love you. Rehoboam's friends said, fear is better. The wise old men said, love is better. Guess who he went with? His buddies. And guess what happened? The nation of Israel was split in two. Rehoboam being the king of Israel, Jeroboam being the king of Judah and Benjamin, and the nation was never the same. Be careful who your friends are, because you're probably going to become like them. That's what happened to Amnon, isn't it? Amnon became a liar if he wasn't already, because his best friend told him to lie. Oh, make yourself, lie down on thy bed and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, and it goes on from there, not just lie, Amnon, lie to your dad, the king. Lie to the person you're supposed to respect most in your life besides God. Lie to him. Wicked advice, isn't it? Be careful who your friends are. Psalm 1, which we again, talked about in Sunday school, but I'll share with everyone. Psalm 1 and verse 1, especially spoke to me this week about this. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. You and I are blessed if we do not walk in the advice of ungodly people. That's why we don't need to read the books of heretics. We don't need the world's advice on X, Y, Z. We need what God's word has to say about it. Don't walk in the advice of ungodly people. Don't have ungodly people as your counselors who are ungodly people, people that reject God's word. Oh, but they're my parents. They're my grandparents. They're my siblings. It doesn't matter. Find people that will counsel you according to God's word. But they tell me what I want to hear. So what? What we want to hear might make us feel good. It might also make us feel good as we march toward destruction. We need truth, not ear tickling, don't we? The people that love us are the people that will tell us the truth. We need to get that in our heads. The people that love us are the people that will tell us the truth. Not the people that will tell us what we want to hear. We're blessed if we do not follow the advice of ungodly people. We're blessed if we do not walk with ungodly people. And have them as our friends and our best friends. You say, well then I won't have any friends. So be it. 
It's better than being like them and becoming like them and, and ruining your life. You say it's not fun, it's a hard decision, it's a fight. Yes, it is. And it's not fun and it is hard. But you look back at the few friends that you have that are godly, that will encourage you in the Lord and you say praise God for those people. Don't worry about being popular. The way of this world is popular. The way of Christ is not. I have to remind myself of that too, and I have to fight it too. We're blessed if we do not walk with ungodly people, and we are blessed if we do not let God, ungodly people teach us. Who are ungodly people? They're the people that reject God and his word. They're the people given over to money, given over to power, given over to these ungodly things of this world. And if all we do is sit under their teaching, we will become like them. You say, well, I don't feel like I am. It's not instantaneous. It's over a period of time. We need to be taught by godly people, people that love God and his word. Otherwise, we'll become just like the world. Just like the world. Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 10 warns us about ungodly associations. It says, my son, if sinners can entice thee, <laughs> what's? Jonadab doing to Amnon, he's enticing him. He knows what Amnon wants. He knows it's ungodly, and he's enabling, enabling him to do this. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. What should Jonadab have done to Amnon? He said, Tamar is not for you, buddy. You know I love you, Amnon, but Tamar is not for you. You need to get over this. You need to repent of it. You need to stop this nonsense. We need to hear that sometimes, don't we? They didn't do that. Instead, he condoned and justified and enabled sin. The Bible says, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as a grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. Solomon says, my son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. They run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Oh, it might be fun for a little while. It might be thrilling. You think of the story of gangsters like Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, I'm sure it was thrilling for them for a little while, and then they ended up with a showdown at the end of their lives and ended up being shot to death by the authorities. Oh, it's fun for a little while, but then the little while runs out. Sin is pleasurable for a season, is it not? Folks, we need to watch our associations. Proverbs 13.10 talks about that also. Separate from those that refuse to follow Christ. Join ourselves to those that love him, as we talked about previously. We're doing one or the other. Who are your friends? Who are you around all the time? You say, well, I don't have any friends. Yes, you do if you will claim them. Yes, you do if you will claim them. But it's our choice. You say, well, where, where can I find friends? Well, that's what the church is for. <laughs> it's not for us to come and go home and ignore everyone the rest of the week. It's for us to come and fellowship and pray for one another and be friends together because we all are to have the best things in common, and that is Jesus Christ. 
It's our choice, though. We will either separate from the world to the Lord or from the Lord and to the world. The Bible's clear on that. And we know what Amnon chose. He chose to become just like Jonadab, didn't he? Number three, be careful to live in truth and not lies. Be careful to live in truth. Jonadab said, go ahead and lie. Amnon lied to his father. He lied to his servants. He lied to his sister. He became a man that lived in lies. We have to be a people that love truth because our God loves truth. And he sees lying as what? An abomination. And he calls it such in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 22. It's an abomination. It's one of the things that God hates is lying. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Bearing false witness is lying. We need to live in truth. People say, well, if I give the truth, then I'll get in trouble. So be it. There's more respect for a person that gets in trouble for telling the truth than someone that's found out to be a liar, isn't there? We see in 2 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, God's people are to love truth. We're to live in it. It's to be the standard, the very foundation of our lives. John says, I love you in the truth. I glory, he says, I rejoice to see your children walking in the truth the truth. We're people that are to love the truth and not lies. You say, well, it's hard. Yep. It fights against my pride. Yes, it does. But do you want to become like Amnon? Do you want to become like David or any, like Abraham, who was caught in his lies several times? David, who lied to cover up his sin with Bathsheba, and many times in Scripture we see people getting caught in lies, paying the price for it, don't we? Be careful to live in truth and not lies. Number four, be careful to have propriety in our lives, meaning taking care to do what's right, to guard our testimony. Be careful to have propriety. We have at least three situations in the Bible where if good propriety would have been observed, those situations wouldn't have happened. You have in Genesis 39, verse 1 through 20, where Joseph and Potiphar's wife, Joseph knew that Potiphar's wife was going after him. He knew that was a thing with her. And he withheld himself from her. But there was a day when Joseph and Potiphar's wife were alone in the house together. And that should have never been. And that's how he got thrown into jail. Because she tried to get him, then he, she lied about him. And Potiphar, I mean, who do you think Potiphar's going to believe? His own wife or the slave that he bought? <laughs> of course he's going to go with his wife going to follow what his wife says or believe what she's saying. So he cast Joseph into jail and he had to linger there. But if propriety would have been observed, that would never have happened, would it? Samson's situation where he had his hair cut and his eyes put out and he's enslaved at the millstone for a time. It would have been avoided if he had never been by himself with Delilah. With a woman he never should have had, never should have desired. Yeah. See that in Judges 16, verse 16 through 21. It could have been avoided, and it could have been avoided here too. Because Amnon said, let everyone leave. Let everyone leave. Why was Amnon able to do what he did to Tamar? Because there was no one to stop it. There was no propriety there, was there? 
And so the lesson is this. We have to be careful to guard our testimonies. People say, well, I'm, I've, I've seen this so many times from Bible college students that don't like rules. Seriously. Well, I'm 18, so I'm an adult, and I know how to handle myself. Or I'm 20, so I'm an adult, and I know I ought to be able to do whatever I want. And I had it just this week even. We're talking about Bible colleges for our kids and what we could recommend. And some guy pipes up and says, well, your children, when they're 18, they ought to be able to choose what they want. And I said, well, one, if you're just now thinking about colleges when you're 18, that's a bit late. <laughs> I know. I know they recommend you to start looking at colleges at least from when you start high school and start thinking about all that. Because when you're 18, you graduate high school and you're sitting there saying, well, where am I going to go in the fall? That's too late. It's too late. It takes about a year. We had... That with, with uh, Matthew, we learned it takes about a year to get all your ducks in a row just to prepare for the next year. We're going to have that in August with Phoebe. I said, but two, as long as my kids are under my roof, they're under my authority, <laughs> and especially as their pastor and as their father, that is to be so because that's what the Bible says. He didn't like that, but it's what the Bible says. When a child turns 18, the United States in some ways says that a child is an adult and in some ways not. It's kind of convoluted, isn't it? But here's the fact. My wife and I have learned this. Age is just a number. Because when that child turns 18, it doesn't mean that they're mentally, emotionally ready to be an adult. It's just the truth. It's just the truth. The world doesn't want to believe that, but it is the truth. People say, well, I can do whatever I want. I should be able to do whatever I want. No. We need to be accountable. We need accountability in our lives. Because here's the fact. Two people that do not belong to one another that are alone in a room together with no accountability so often leads to bad things. <laughs> and you could say a room, you could say a car, <laughs> right? Any closed space with no one else around, no accountability leads to bad things. And how many times does that happen in the Bible? And how much do we have to see that to understand we need accountability for our lives? We need it for our children. You know, I, I didn't, I went out dating too. I went to the public schools too. My parents didn't know any better. They'd probably do it differently now. I didn't have chaperones on dates. My wife was a chaperone on date, a chaperone on dates that could be bought. I didn't learn about all of that till I went to Bible college and learned about a third person. And was that awkward and what have you? Yeah. But propriety is important. How many times did we hear stories at college of someone finding a couple in a classroom and then being marched <laughs> to the dean of students or whatever because they refused to believe in accountability i could tell you story after story the story that grandpa would tell us he was going by and he saw a classroom that was light and then it was dark and he went in there's a couple in there what are you two doing oh we're just studying in a pitch black room oh yes marched him right to the dean of students, who was Keith Kaiser at that time. And that's a man you don't want to cross. <laughs> Folks, we need accountability. We need to stop saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm however old, I don't need this. Yeah, we do need it. We need to guard our lives because how many lives are destroyed? How many 
ministers, how many church members, how many in the world are destroyed day in, day out, because there was no propriety. That's just pride on our part. We have to guard our testimonies. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 and through 27 talks about that. We need to guard ourselves and our testimonies. Let's read those few verses, if you would. We're making decent time, I guess. The Bible says, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings, let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thy heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. It's saying guard yourself. Jesus says, do whatever it takes to guard yourself. Guard yourself. You say, well, I love that person. Then marry them. <laughs> if you love them. If that's who God has given you. It's that simple. As long as it lines up with God's word. We need accountability in our lives. We need that propriety. If there was a propriety, if there was that accountability, this would never have happened with Am Amnon, Tamar, and Absalom, right? Number five, be careful to control your emotions. We've already said this. Either we control our emotions or our emotions will control us. It's one or the other. Because hatred and lust are passionate feelings, but God gives us control over ourselves. So what temperance is, it's self-control. As Galatians 5, 23 says, is a fruit of the Spirit. God gives us control over ourselves. And wouldn't you know in Matthew 5, they're the first two things that Christ addresses in the Sermon on the Mount. Hatred, wrath, temper, and lust. Two things especially that ruin so many lives, churches, homes, workplaces, governments. We need to work on our hearts and work on them every day. Amnon was a man given over to his emotions. John Adab condoned it. Many people in our day are the same way. Oh, I'm just an emotional person. I can't help it. You can help it with God's help if you're saved. And to say you can't help it is to deny that God is able to help you, which he is. So Amnon felt he was justified in how he felt. You know, we can feel a great many things, a great many ways towards a great many people. And we can be right in some ways and wrong in others. How do we know what's what? Right here. Right here. You have people in our day call themselves Christians, hate people that are of a different political party, hate people that like different sports. It's not right. You have people on the other side the same way that are of the world. You have people out there that say, well, men can marry men and women can marry women because they love each other. No, they don't. They lust after each other. Just like so many men and women lust after each other. And we need God to help us to be in control. Be in control. Because God will help us. We either believe that or we don't. Proverbs 25, verse number 16. 
Proverbs 25 and verse number 16, the Bible says, for a just man, nope, wrong one, that's 24. 25 says, hast thou found honey, eat so, <clears throat> excuse me, eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. You say, what's that have to do with my feelings? This is a person that will not control what they eat. They refuse to. And so they eat so much. They were like Jimmy was years and years ago when he was just learning how to control all of that. And you eat so much, it makes you sick. You throw it up. It's just one way we need to learn control is control our eating habits. We live in a country where people are obese, and they are. Why? Because they refuse to control what they eat. They refuse to have a proper diet. Gluttony is a sin. Yes, this is a preacher saying that. It is a sin. We need to have a balanced diet and i'm not saying all of us need to be on weight watchers I'm just saying we need to learn what is good for us and eat it i know a preacher he lives off of sweet tea that's not good for you we need water our bodies are made for water and things like sweet tea dehydrate us <laughs> Instead of hydrating, coffee is the same. I know people, they drink pots and pots of coffee. That's bad for us. We need water. People drink soda. And one soda here and there is not everything in moderation, as we say. But there's people that live off of soda. And it's bad for us. Not just the chemicals, but the sugar. Say, oh, I drink diet soda. Well, you're just injecting yourself with cancer, basically. Good on you. It's terrible. The saccharin and the chemical sugars and things, it's not good for us. That's just one aspect of it. There's people who refuse to eat fruits and vegetables. There's people, all they do is eat fruits and vegetables. Both are bad for us. <laughs> we need a balanced diet. Balanced diet. Otherwise, we won't be healthy. We had to learn that food dye was bad years ago. We, anyone remember Fruity Cheerios? I don't think they still have it. But years ago, when Phoebe was a baby, we got Fruity Cheerios because we got a really good deal. I think we got like for free or something. But then we learned that food dye is bad for you. <laughs> Because she ate those fruity Cheerios and it was just, it was bad what happened. Folks, we need to watch ourselves. This is talking about diet. It talks about it again in Proverbs 25 and verse 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Amnon had no rule over himself. Ended up his destruction. God will help us to balance our lives out. But we have to seek such things. And we have to let go of the golden calves. We got to let it go. Because there's people who say, well, I just love my food. I'm not going to stop eating. There's people who say, I love lusting after this, that, and the other. I'm not going to let it go. I love my hatred. I love this. and lo There's people who love being miserable and they love making other people miserable. We have to let it go and determine to follow Christ. It's the only way we'll grow in the Lord. Be careful to control your emotions. And lastly, and this will go quickly, I believe, be careful to play your role well. And this is on David. What Absalom chose to do is on Absalom. But that David failed to deal with Amnon is on David. David's the man, again, after God's own heart. But he never taught his children how to have a heart for God, apparently. And if he did, it didn't take, did it? I mean, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 through 9, we know that the Bible tells every parent, teach your children diligently to love the Lord. Teach your children diligently. It means purposefully. 
purposefully. We know other passages that talk about that. And David, he heard, he got mad, but he never did anything. Absalom gave him two years. He never did anything. It's like you or I, we hear about something happening that we have control over, and David did. We have control over, we have the ability in our home or wherever to make it right. And oh yeah, we get all good and mad and self-righteous and indignant about it, but we never do anything. We never do anything to correct it. Well, what good does that do? <laughs> when we're the ones that can act and make it right. And by the way, as far as our, our country and as far as our world, there's so few things that we can affect. I mean, I get mad and indignant about things in the church sometimes, but I remind myself I'm not in control of people. <laughs> I get mad and indignant about certain things in my house at times. That's what I can control. Even then, I have to respond appropriately. But we get mad and indignant about things in our country. There's not much we can do about it. We can pray. We all do. It can be a good testimony. Give the gospel, and we ought to. But the fact of the matter is this, that's all we can do. And being just all self-righteous and indignant about it, it's not going to help anything. It doesn't mean don't get mad at sin. It just means don't ruin your testimony. <laughs> because plenty of believers are doing that. David, it seems in the scripture, he was an absent parent. Oh, he had children, but he didn't parent them. And the Bible says if you're going to have children, they're a blessing from the Lord. That's what Psalm 127 says. They're given to us by the Lord, so we have to parent them. I mean, there's parents out there, oh, just let the kids do whatever they want. Let them choose whatever they want. Let them go their own way. Well, be prepared for kids to go their own way unto their own destruction. Because there's a reason the Bible says train up a child in the way they should go. We have to tell children what they're going to do. Like if Jimmy wakes up tomorrow, I don't feel like doing school. Well, you're doing school anyway. Well, I'm feeling bad. Well, that's one thing. If you just don't feel like it, that's another. Or Phoebe wakes up, uh, I, I'm not feeling sick. I just don't feel like going to work. Well, you're going to work anyway. Just so, well, I don't, I'm not sick, but I don't feel like going to church. Well, you're going to church anyway, and you're going to be in family devotions anyway, and you're going to do what you should do anyway. Because that's what they need to be taught. And that's what they're going to do in the world according to as they are or are not taught. I could give you instance after instance after instance after instance. David was basically, as we understand it, an absent parent. Oh, he had children. Plenty of people in the world do today. But they're not available they don't make themselves available. They don't teach their children. Plenty of believers do this. They don't teach your children to follow the Lord. Folks, I will say it again. Our children are not to be seen as burdens. They're not to be seen as dolls that we play dress up with. I know plenty of mothers do that. It's disgusting. Just dress them up and let's just, oh, aren't they so cute? And oh, whatever they do is wonderful. Never prepare their children to leave the home one day. Never teach them a thing. Again, I could give you example after example. Our children are not to be seen as burdens or dolls. They're to be seen as our most important ministry. A ministry. Because God gave them to us to disciple them and not to lose them. 
right? Not for the public schools to teach them. There's someone this week, should I homeschool my kids? Yes, you should homeschool your kids and teach them well. Because we have a good public school. Well, even the good public school is going to throw them into the deep end of the cesspool of the world. They're going to be around ungodly teachers and ungodly friends and ungodly students and classmates and things like that. And then people excuse it. Well, I think I turned out okay. Hey, folks, I went to the public schools all my 13 years. And I wish I never would have been there because it affects you in so many negative ways. And then there's someone that says, well, they're, they're sent to be a missionary to their friends in the public schools. That ought never to be laid as a burden on to those poor kids. The teenage years of a child and teenagers, yes, are children. Sorry, kids, you are. But the teenage years of a child, as well as the earlier years, children are very pliable, very teachable, very impressionable. And either the world's going to teach them or we will. It's a fact. Well, I don't want to brainwash my kids, so let the public schools brainwash them if you want to see it as brainwashing. Teaching is not brainwashing, it is teaching. <laughs> well, they're only there for five days out of the week. They're only there for six hours out of the day. Yeah, and how much of a hold do you think that has on them? Come on, let's be real. <laughs> our kids are our most important ministry. God gave them to us. David failed in that. You say, how could he? He did. <laughs> he did. Six lessons this week. This is today, I should say. We'll continue Wednesday. Be careful who you fall in love with. Make sure that love is real love and not lust. Be careful who your friends are. Be careful to live in truth and not lies. Be careful to have propriety in our lives. Be careful to control your emotions. And be careful to play your role well. Wednesday, we'll look at the choice that Absalom made about all this that happened to his sister Tamar. We'll see what God has for us there. Father, we pray that you'd help us. We pray that you'd encourage us to do what's right. What we can control with our lives, help us to do so. Father, help us to do so by faith. Thank you for your word. While there's great many probably uncomfortable things that we talked about today, I believe they're necessary, very clear lessons that we can grab from this passage. Help us, we pray. Help us to guard our lives. Help us to follow Christ. Thank you for all that you do for us, and thank you for the good that will come of today, we trust. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, let's stand together. My wife's going to come play. What is God speaking to your heart about? Is he speaking about salvation? Is he speaking about one of these six things? Maybe he's talking about something completely different that we covered. What is he talking to you about? Whatever it is, don't just pass it off. Respond to God and say yes. If, even if you don't know how to apply it, if you don't know how to apply it, come talk to me or my wife and we'll help you. But whatever it is, talk to God, say yes, Lord, by, with your help, by your grace, this is what I'll do. And he'll help you. You say, it's the same thing I've been working on for weeks and months. Well, keep working on that thing. God will give you the victory over it. Some things do take time. 
The important thing is if God's saying the same thing over and over and we're not working on it, he's not going to stop talking. We need to give in and surrender to him. Sarah's going to play. Take this time to talk to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this time, and we pray that you'd be pleased with us as we depart from here and go and apply what we learned today to our lives. We pray that you would be glorified, the world would see a difference in us. And we pray that folks would come to Christ, friends and family, just pray you would work and people would be saved. You would plow up the hard hearts. Soften the stiff-necked. Work, we pray. Please. And help us to continue praying. We'll thank you for it. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A few prayer requests for you today. Uh, do pray for Matthew as he's got some projects going on. Again, please don't forget to sign his card back there. We'll have that out for Wednesday too, I believe, but please sign his card. But pray for him as he's marching through the semester. Keep praying for my mother, if you would, as she's still in pain and needs that, uh, needs some answers. Pray for Jimmy and Sarah, that's Sarah, as they're looking for jobs. So pray for them. And I know they, all those folks appreciate that. And pray for Winston's parents, too. They're traveling, right, to Florida. So pray for these folks. Let's turn to hymn number 473. We'll sing Victory in Jesus, a verse, and then we'll be excused or dismissed. Not really excused. 473, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning 
of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. God bless you for being here today. It's good to see you. If we can be a help, please let us know. But we hope to see you Wednesday, 7 o'clock. God bless you. Have a good week. Praying for you.